All right, welcome back to another edition of Financial Accounting. So just a quick look at the calendar here. We're going to talk about 6.3 and 6.4 today. Next Friday, we have exam three, and it's coming up fast. If you have any issues or questions, please let me know. Happy to meet with you outside of office hours. Remember that I have office hours on Tuesdays and Thursdays, but they're getting kind of filled in. So the sooner you come and see me with, to resolve any questions or concerns you have, the better, the more likely you're to get in and see me on my office hours. So without any further ado, 6.3 and 6.4, this is kind of a fun section of the chapter because it really harkens to those people who are marketing and finance majors. We talked last time about the consequences of LIFO. There are also consequences of FIFO. First in, first out. In particular, realize that our FIFO ending inventory balance is usually the newer merchandise because we got rid of the older merchandise. Cost of goods sold is the old. Cost of goods sold equals the older stuff. Therefore, what's left behind is the newer stuff. And some people say, well, isn't it good to have the fresher stuff? Like if we're a grocery store, Shouldn't FIFO give us leave us with the, the the most fresh stuff, the newest stuff? And that's true. That's true. But there's still concerns. There's always concerns when you're a business owner. So what are the concerns if we are um, a first in, first out inventory cost uh, method chooser or accountant? In this case, if we cannot sell it, we have a concern that arises. And realize that if you're a marketing major especially, you know that Tastes and preferences change very quickly. So if we cannot sell this stuff, we're left with goods that do not sell. So we can try to reduce the price, reduce the price, reduce the price. But realize if we cannot sell it, it becomes a point where maybe we have to write down the inventory to a lower value. Maybe we don't quite write it off. Maybe we just have to keep reducing the price until, find, until we find someone who will buy it. Well, the problem with changing the price is on, oftentimes we're being very subjective. We're being very uh, biased in our own choosing of prices. We need to be more objective, but they realize that the inventory, when we write it down to a lower value, we make it to the point where we write it below the actual cost. If we write it down below cost, then we have the concern of, excuse me one second here, shut up. Okay, there we go. If we write it below cost, then potentially it means currently our inventory, as it shows in our balance sheet, is overstated. And if it's overstated, the overstated asset means that we have misstated financial statements and that can result in losses. So how can we check to see if the inventory is overvalued? We use this method called lower of cost or market. Basically saying that, look, in our T account for inventory, we already have cost, historical cost. We need to ask ourselves, is that the lowest of, of itself or the market value? It's based on the principles of relevance and representational faithfulness. We want to show in the cost as the most adequate, realistic number out there. But we also want to make sure it's truthful. We want to make sure it's objective. So it requires inventory to be reported at whichever is lower. The inventory's historical cost, which is what we already see in the inventory, or its market value, which requires us to do a lot more research in terms of finding, hey, who is currently buying this stuff? So in, when we do this, when we implement the lower of cost of market, we're essentially following uh, this net realizable value theory where we're showing all of our assets at what amount we expect to realize from this inventory when we sell it. Because companies don't want to hold on to inventory. They want to get rid of it. Similar to NRV for accounts receivable, right? We don't want to show an amount that's too high. We want to show an amount that's that's more realizable, more rational. So for instance, let's assume that we're a company that has t-shirts. And let's say we have a bunch of these 2020 best year ever t-shirts. We thought they were going to sell really quickly, but uh, apparently 2020 didn't turn out the way we wanted to. We can see on our, in our inventory T account that we have this $300,000 amount of inventory. That's because we bought 10,000 units at $30 a piece. Okay, but they're not selling. So regardless, we may have set the price at $60 a shirt, then we reduce it down to 50, and then we reduce it down to 40. Maybe it's at $30 a shirt and they're still not selling. That's an issue. So we want to figure out is do we, you know, what is the current price? What's a uh, more realistic price level or market value level for these shirts? The best way to determine that is to use what's called replacement cost. In other words, if we had to buy those 10,000 units of those exact same t-shirts today, 
what would we have to pay for those shirts? That's replacement cost. So if we contact the manufacturer and say, hey, 10,000 t-shirts of those 2020 shirts, how much would those cost me today? And the manufacturer says, well, today I can, I can sell them to you about $20 a piece. Well, that means that's the replacement cost. And we want to compare that. Which one's lower? Is it the market value, the replacement cost, or is it the current cost in our T account? In this case, we see that inventory can be replaced for 200000 That's the market value. But currently, we're showing that inventory on our books at 300000 That means we are overstating, overvaluing our inventory by 100000 That's not good. We need to write down our inventory to a lower level. So writing down inventory means we're going to decrease it. Not write it off, we're just going to decrease it. So in this case, we will credit inventory for the 100,000. And when we do that, we'll just bring it from 300,000 down to the 200,000. And that represents the lower of cost or market right there. In particular, that is replacement cost. If replacement cost was higher, we wouldn't have to do anything. We wouldn't adjust it upwards. We're only worried about reducing it downwards because we just don't want to overstate our inventory. Realize that the effects are to record the write down to cost of goods sold. So that's where we're plugging in the difference. It's technically like a loss on inventory, but realize that one of the reasons why we don't call cost of goods sold inventory expense is because Expenses imply something different from losses. Expenses are some sort of deliberate action. Losses are somewhat incidental. Calling something the cost of goods sold is more, um, it's just more general. It's more abstract. So the cost of goods sold incorporates losses and expenses. So in this case, if we have to do a write down 100,000, just throw it in the cost of goods sold because it's the cost of doing business, right? And sometimes it, if it takes us more money to get rid of this stuff, then so be it. So we're just going to incorporate this into the cost of goods sold because that sucker is a real effect that happened in the current period. So that's all you really need to know. Make sure you understand that for the sake of the exam. Um, 6.4 is a little bit more fun because we start talking about ratio analysis. And we'll talk about in particular in this case, gross profit percentage inventory turnover and today's inventory outstanding. The gross profit percentage or GP percentage is also known as the gross profit rate also known as a gross profit margin. So same terms, you might see them used in different ways. Gross profit percentage is calculated by taking the gross profit amount and dividing it by net sales revenue. And recall that gross profit itself is just simply net sales revenue minus cost of goods sold. So revenue minus cost of goods sold equals gross profit. If you take that amount, right, and you divide it by revenue, what you get is a gross profit percentage. A lot of times financial analysis involves taking amounts on the income statement and turning it into a percentage of net sales. So gross profit percentage is simply the gross profit amount stated as a percentage of net sales revenue. That's often how we state things in financial analysis. It's a percentage of something. Okay, and you'll see why that's important in a second. So assume for a second that our gross, our company's gross profit percentage is 40%. How could we communicate that to business professionals? What we would say in this case is that for every $1 in net sales, we generate 40 cents in gross profit. That's one way of looking at the percentage. Another way of saying it, stating it and looking at it is by saying gross profit is 40% of net sales revenue. A lot of different ways of saying the same number, but the idea here is you want to communicate some what that percentage means in some sort of understandable or realistic terms that people can digest and understand. It also indicates if it's a 40% gross profit percentage, it indicates that 60% of net sales is cost of goods sold. So in the case above, if revenue is 100% and gross profit in this example is 40%, that means therefore that the cost of goods sold represents 60% of revenue. So for every $1, of a beer that we drink, 60 cents is the cost to make it. Let's just say that's not a realistic gross profit, but that's one way of interpreting that. Gross profit percentage is a key indicator of a company's ability to sell inventory at a profit. Realize the ability to sell inventory is based on revenue, whether or not they actually got rid of it, right? But getting rid of it and getting rid of it at a profit are two very, very different things. And merchandisers strive to increase their gross profit as much as possible. The way they do that is by increasing revenue and or decreasing price. You may have revenue minus cost of goods sold and that gets you a gross profit. If you increase revenue and keep cost of goods sold the same, whoop, like that, keep that same, you're going to increase, whoop, 
gross profit. Likewise, and then the way to increase gross profit is to simply say, keep revenue the same, but then shrink down costs very like that. And that way you get a really big, much bigger increase in gross profit. So how do we increase profits, increase revenue, or decrease cost of goods sold? How do we increase revenue? Talk to the marketing people. Ask them what's up. How do we decrease cost of goods sold? Talk to everybody else because a lot of those costs are being derived from people who work for us. People are very, very expensive. Some examples of using the gross profit percentage here. If I tell you the gross profit percentage is 40% and I tell you that net sales is 1,000, can you tell me how much the gross profit amount is? Amounts and percentages, be very careful. These problems on the exam and the homework are kind of tricky. You have to read them very carefully. The gross profit amount in this case is $400 or 40% of $1,000. That's how you would determine that, right? Just multiply across. Gross profit percentage is 25%. Net sales is 1,000. What if I asked you, what is the cost of goods sold amount? Well, the cost of goods sold in this case would be 750. How do you know that? You have to do a little bit of algebra. 100% minus 25% is 75%. As I said before, that represents the cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales revenue. So 75% as a percentage of 1,000 means 750. You have to kind of do the math on this stuff and see it. For yourself work these problems out on paper to make sure you understand how these things work because they will be tested on the exam gross profit amount in this case therefore would be 250 which is just simply taking the 25 percent gross profit rate and multiplying it by a thousand or what we can do is take the 750 cost of goods sold amount and subtract that from a thousand sales revenue i recommend drawing a picture draw a picture so you can see it generally speaking net sales revenue is going to be 100% of itself. That makes sense. Net sales revenue divided by net sales revenue is that is 1 or 100%, right? So, 100% cost of goods sold as a percentage of of as a percentage of net sales revenue is, well, if I don't know what that is, I can figure that out because I know what this is, I know what this is, I know what this is. I can figure out gross profit as a percentage of net sales just by doing a little bit of algebra there. And then I can come across and figure out what is cost of goods sold amount. And I can also do the math and figure out what the gross profit amount is too. So it just takes some time to draw things out. But I recommend, especially for this upcoming exam, that you get comfortable sketching things out quickly. Don't waste time on this fall, on the next exam. It's very detailed. If net sales um, is $1,000 and cost of goods sold is $650, what is the gross profit percentage? Draw out the picture, I say. Net sales revenue is 100% of itself. It was $1,000. I tell you, cost of goods sold. Now I can figure out, boom, I can figure out what is gross profit. Then I can take that and divide it by the net sales revenue to determine, boom, gross profit percentage. And if I want to, I can also figure out what the cost of goods sold is as a percentage of net sales. It's just a bunch of, a bunch of fun math, but I recommend drawing a picture and plugging in the amounts. It's easier to see that sometimes than just doing it in your head. Here's a more complicated one. Recall that under the periodic method, periodic inventory system, right? We can determine cost of goods sold by taking beginning plus purchases minus ending and get us cost of goods sold, okay? Well, we're gonna use that here in a second, but imagine I'm asking you, what is gross profit amount or percentage given the following information? Net sales revenue is a thousand. Right, that's on my income statement. Then I go through and I give you information about beginning purchases and ending inventory. Can you figure out gross profit, and gross profit amount just from that? Sure you can. Draw it out and plug in what you know. Beginning purchases, ending. Based on that math, you can determine cost of goods sold. Okay. Revenue is a thousand. You know that as a percentage of itself, it's a hundred percent. Plug in the cost of goods sold amount directly here. And then just, boom, figure out what the gross profit amount is. Then you can figure out what is the percentage of sales. So two, three. Sometimes it just takes a step-by-step -step process, but I recommend drawing things out. Hopefully you guys uh, see that in the PowerPoint slides I gave you to help you out with those homework problems. You can see that I'm drawing pictures to sort of figure out what I know. I know just enough to figure out the answers to these things. Do these things. So you need to practice this stuff for the third exam. It's just going to be a very time-consuming exam. Uh, all I can do is just forewarn you and give you practice on this stuff. Why is gross profit percentage useful? In order to answer that, we have to take a step back and say, why is financial analysis useful? And what is financial analysis? Financial analysis involves scaling. 
uh, i.e. ratio analysis. And scaling is essentially taking gross or raw numbers and dividing it by a scalar to create what's a perspective about the numbers. The amounts themselves are very large in financial analysis. The amounts can be very distracting. They don't really give us a lot of information in and of themselves. A billion dollar company is a billion dollar company. Nike and, and Under Armour are billion dollar companies. You can say that because they both have net sales revenues in the billions of dollars. Nike's net sales for 2016 was $32.4 billion. Under Armour's net sales was $4.8 billion or billion dollar companies. Someone look at that and say, well, Nike is you know very, very big. You know, they're four times, five times, ten times bigger. Right? Fine. Are they the better company? It depends on how efficient they are with the resources they've got. Okay, just because you're bigger doesn't mean you're better. Nike's cost of goods sold for 2016 was 17.4 billion. Under Armour's was only 2.6 billion. Their gross profit for Nike is 15 billion. Gross profit for Under Armour 2 billion. So again, you can say that um, Nike has a greater gross profit amount than Under Armour. Does that mean Nike is better? Well, take the amount of gross profit. And divide it by its sales revenue for both companies. Well, what do you get? You see that Nike has a gross profit margin about 46.2%. Well, guess what? Under Armour has a gross profit margin of 46.4%. So even though the gross profit amount is bigger for Nike, the gross profit percentage is actually bigger for Under Armour. But they're pretty close. And some people would look at that and say, ah, they're roughly the same. But think about this, too. The difference between these guys is 0.2% of net sales. So if I look in the case of Under Armour, Under Armour has is on a, on a percentage basis, multiply that sucker by $4.825 billion, right? What's 0.2 of $4.8 billion? That's a lot of money, folks. That may not seem like much, 0.2%, but it's basically showing a couple things. Under Armour is keeping... You know, it's, it's selling their goods roughly at the same gross profit percentage as Nike. So you're not necessarily getting buying when you buy Under Armour, you're not getting a discount uh, from Nike's price. You're basically paying the same amount for the same style, for the same quality of goods. Okay, but it just shows that some people are willing to pay maybe a slight hair more for Under Armour's products than they are for Nike. Fair enough which has a higher gross profit percentage. It's the same thing as saying which company is generating more gross profit amount per $1 of net sales. It's the same thing. Okay, you can just look at the gross profit percentage and say that the gross profit amount generated from $1 of sales is greater for Under Armour by a slight amount. So roughly they're about the same. So the whole point of that is just to realize that size does not necessarily matter, at least when it comes to financial analysis. Okay. Extending scaling to uh, net income. So the profit margin sounds the same as gross profit margin, but it's not. It's really net income as a percentage of sales. It indicates general profitability. Remember, net income is the bottom line. Net income is the bottom line. Bottom line, brass tax, whatever you want to call it. What's the bottom line? Take that as a percentage of net sales revenue. Create a common income statement. Um, so in this case, we have the $3.2 billion Nike uh, had net income of 3.8 billion. Divide that by revenue, you get 12%. You do that for Under Armour. You know, Under Armour actually only has 5%. So in this case, you can see that which one has more profit overall, net income? That's going to be Nike. Which one has a greater net income margin or net income percentage or profit margin? Well, we can say that one was also Nike. Okay, so which is the same thing as saying which one is generating more profit per one dollar? It's Nike. It's the same way of saying that second bullet point there. So what does that indicate? Perhaps, maybe, the reason why this is low is because they have higher higher selling general and administrative expenses uh, as a percentage of net sales relative to Nike. Probably because they have to do more advertising than Nike does. Advertising um, to remain competitive, under Armour may have more advertising expenses than Nike as a percentage of net sales because in order to be competitive, perhaps Under Armour needs to spend more money just to get people to buy their products. That seems reasonable. So bigger can mean better. Generally, you get another reason why this happens is because of what's called economies of scale, where you can get more out of something the bigger you are. 
So the more you have, the more you're going to generate. So you don't need to consume as much in resources because you can let your resources do the work for you. So that's gross profit percentage. And that's how it's useful. That's the way we can analyze things. Let's talk about days turnover and days inventory outstanding. Um, inventory turnover, uh, or EDO, is calculated as taking cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. And average inventory is just the beginning plus ending divided by two. It's the ratio of cost of goods sold to average inventory. What does that give us? Well, it gives us an indication about how quickly inventory is sold. How many times do we fill up inventory, sell it, and then repeat? Fill it up, sell it, repeat. Take a look at this in a visual in a second. It varies drastically from industry to industry. It also depends also on the nature of how efficient the uh, the company is. Some companies use what's called just-in-time inventory management. You may see that in your management class, just-in-time inventory management. They only keep a small amount of inventory on hand just to help meet immediate demand. Some companies stockpile industry six months, 12 months at a time because, hey, you never know when you're going to need that inventory. So it can vary from in, from industry to industry. Sometimes it's not very interpretable. Some people don't look at Edo as something that's understandable. So what we can do is take 365 calendar days divided by Edo and we get what's called DO, days inventory outstanding, which indicates how long our inventory stays on the shelf until it's sold. So a visual will help you understand this even better. So let's take a look at Under Armour. Under Armour 2015 versus 2016. So if we look at end of the year 2016 and the beginning of the year 2016, we can see that the average inventory is $850 million. If we compare uh, end of 2015 with beginning of 2015, we can see that it's $661 million. We have average inventory, we got cost of goods sold, we can do some math. Take the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. And we get ourselves an EDO, cost of goods sold, divided by average inventory gives us EDO, 3.4 times, 3.11 times. What does that mean? One way to interpret that is we build up inventory, then we sell it three times, roughly three times per year. It also means it takes about 120 days to sell inventory. So imagine you got like day zero, right? You go to day 120, right? So it's like you stockpile inventory, then sell it, build it, build it up and then sell it off. It takes 120 days to sell it all. It's not exactly what's going on, but the idea here is that we want to make it much quicker. We don't want to leave stuff on the shelf because realize you have to uh, pay people to uh, uh, keep it, maintain it, to, to keep it secure. You need security. You need lighting and heating, and you need people to go back into the dressing room and refold the clothes, right? It's painful. We want this to be low. Okay. We don't, companies don't make money by holding inventory. They make money by selling inventory. Just like banks don't make money by holding money. They make money by lending money. Okay. So you have to be aware of what resources are really all about. To give you a visual about what's going on here, <clears throat> here's the turnovers, 3.0, 3.1. Edo answers the following question. How many times do we fill up inventory to its average level and then sell it all off? So here's a comparison of 2016 uh, to 2015, okay? So you can see in 2016, we're building it up to an average level, right, about 850,000. Here it's something on the way of like what, five, uh, 600 and, what does that say, 680. That's the average right there, right? Build it up, sell it off, there's one. Build it up, sell it off, two. Build it up, sell it off, three, okay? So it's roughly build it up and sell it off three times. So about 120 days, in inventory, sort of look at it like that. Whereas in this case, you can see we may not have as much inventory, but we're selling it off a little bit quicker here. So there's one, two, 3.11 times right there. You got the little, the little hanger right there, okay? So that's basically saying in this case, it takes up roughly about 117 days. Okay, it's selling it off a little bit quicker. So sometimes the less you hold, the quicker you can sell it because you can focus your time and effort on just getting rid of a smaller amount than you can on selling a large amount. Some people want to. Some people have asked me, "Hey, well, how's this compared to Nike?" Okay, if you look at Nike's 2016 compared to Under Armour's 2016, you see that Nike it takes them three. At least their inventory is not to exaggerate. Five million is now the the y-axis top here, and you can see that Nike built up their inventory to roughly about 4.6 billion dollars here. That's their average, and again, 850 million is Under Armour. So Under Armour is smaller for sure, but do the smaller mean worse, bigger mean better? Let's take a look here. 
Nike builds up their inventory and sells it one, two, three point eight, roughly three point eight times. Whereas Under Armour sell, takes them three point four times. So you're gonna see this three point eight times versus three point zero times. Which one is doing better at selling its inventory? It's Nike. They build up their inventory and they build up a lot of it, but they also get rid of it quicker too. So that's a you know that's a pretty significant uh, measure of efficiency. <clears throat> if we take 365 days and divide it by that turnover, it indicates that Nike only has its inventory on the shelf about 96 days before it's sold. Whereas again, Under Armour it takes them about 120 days to sell their inventory. So overall, who's better here? Nike's definitely bigger. It has a higher cost. It gets sold about seven and a half, seven times higher. Its average inventory is about five and a half times higher. Um, Nike sells its inventory faster than Under Armour. And the reason why you know that is because of two things. One, its Edo is greater, 3.79 versus 3.4 than Under Armour. Nike's Dio is shorter. It's 96 days versus 120 days. So you're going to have to look at these as Dio and Edo work in the opposite direction. If it sort of helps you think about a wheel, okay, this is like, well, this is a wheel, <laughs> okay, right? And you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> this point right here, if it spins around, if it goes faster, if it, if it spins faster, right, it means that particular spoke spends time at that place, less time. Um, if you spin that faster, it means it spends less time in that area. So the greater the rate, the shorter the time, it just sticks, it takes less time to revolve around in that circle. So the time it goes about goes around faster, it means it takes less time to make the, the less time to revolve. Faster means less time, basically. So greater means less time. That's what that's saying there. Those are all the notes I have for three uh, six point three and six point four, six point five and six point six. We'll deal with on Monday. So make sure you're doing the reading and you're asking me questions because those are the key indicators of success in this class. If you have any questions, please let me know.